Hello. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, welcome uh, to this panel. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here. The panel, of course, how Bolsonaro's hate cabinet works, but we're gonna talk about a lot more than Brazil. We're gonna really widen out the conversation to see how some of the lessons that perhaps are being learned in Brazil could be applied elsewhere. So let me introduce my guests, because I'm very happy to have them uh, both here. So Patricia Campos Mello, who's a reporter for Folha de Sao Paulo, which is a, a leading a newspaper in Brazil. Also also a research scholar at Columbia University working on electoral disinformation and that very much uh, the focus on a, of a lot of uh, your work including a book uh, uh, called The Machine of Hate where you focus on fake news and crucially digital violence and also uh, won several awards too many to list but I think the one that catches the eye is the International Press Freedom Award from the CPJ of course the Committee to Protect uh, Journalists and Daniela Pinheiro journalist and editor uh, broke the glass ceiling in Brazil uh, in becoming the first uh, woman to edit uh, News and Current Affairs Weekly magazine, so first uh, woman editor-in-chief, third time, three times winner of Brazil's uh, Brazilian journalism's most prestigious award and has been a fellow both at Stanford and the Reuters Institute uh, for the Study of uh, Journalism. Uh, now, you know, we're all here for uh, the International Journalism Festival, and the word courage comes up a lot when we talk about journalism. So, for example, now we're all following many of our colleagues who are reporting from Ukraine and the obvious risks uh, that are involved uh, in that. There's several journalists uh, here in Perugia who live their lives under police protection because of threats either from the extreme right or from organized crime. But what is particular about Patricia and Daniela uh, or uh, fascist uh, uh, so that is, we will discuss later on and we'll see how that has affected their work and, you know, and their lives as well. So thank you so much for being with us. Let's start with the title of this panel, How Bolsonaro's Cabinet Works. And Patricia, I'm just going to start with you. So obviously you both have some stories, but first of all, just explain it to us because it sounds to be here. Uh, basically, the cabinet of or the Office of Hate is a taxpayer funded disinformation uh, for aides or consultants or actually communications directors directly linked to the president of Brazil, whose main with online on our social media 
years ago, from 25 years ago, going to our personal um, pages. Uh, I remember when I was editing uh, in the magazine, and one of the reasons I prayed and I resigned and left the country And, um, and it happened many times, the reporters giving them the addresses, their addresses, and, uh, and details about their families. But the particularity of this uh, hate cabinet is because one of the leaders of this um, movement, we can say that, is one of Bolsonaro's sons. So this guy, he's a mastermind in digital strategy, he, in, his, um, in, 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 the, in the dark side of the mastermind, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, condition. But um, the, the problem is um, we can't respond to these attacks in, a, in the same way. Because there, are, there are lots of uh, allies, robots, we know how um, they work. And, um, and they are funded by Bolsonaro. Really out of control, WhatsApp and Telegram. WhatsApp and Telegram is like hell. Like, and, and we have to think that in Brazil, I mean, everybody has WhatsApp. WhatsApp, Brazil is the second largest market for WhatsApp. So information, internet equals WhatsApp. And for many people, if I got this information saying that XYZ is a communist or whatever, offers sex in exchange for information, of course I believe it. And of course the difference is between Twitter, Facebook and WhatsApp, that WhatsApp is, it's not public. I mean, Twitter, and in a way that's also yeah. one of the negatives and is harmful, but at least you kind of know what's out there. And, and uh, Daniela, you said something that when they posted your daughter's picture, uh, you said they posted. Again, I know this sounds like a detail, but how do you know it was they? Was it a, a semi-official account? Was it a person you could trace? Or is it like a fake account, but that you know you can trace back? First, the, 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 the first characteristic is um, because the, the same posts were, re were replicated many times with the same um, text, the same image. And when we get into the account, this account has like one follower or, uh, or zero followers, so they are definitely robots. So it was made by someone or, or, or uh, by a group of people with an intention. An intention, it undermines um, my position, my work as a journalist. But for example, I have um, another case um, which was uh, a reporter that I uh, was working with me, and I assigned him um, um, a reportage, a reporting about um, the ideological guru of Bolsonaro, who was always um, a teacher, a coach. And the guy attended, it's another story, not my story, but another guy who attended his um, classes, and he wrote about what the your ideological guru, Bolsonaro's guru, says during their classes, his classes. And then this guy, the Bolsonaro guru, posts in his account the picture of the reporter's house with the address which, uh, we, uh, and with um, a very short um, message, like, okay, he lives there. Something like this. It's the address. So... What do you do? The first thing you do is you go to the legal department of, uh, of... No, the first thing you do is to get the phone call from the reporter. What? <laughs> what should I do? I mean, it's terrifying. Do it's, it's called terrifying. doxing. The guy has it's two terrifying. kids. So it's a, what, what should I do now? So and when you get into the, to the, to the legal department, you realize nobody knows what to do. Um, Companies, media companies are can, not. Can prepared. I just stop you for a question? Because I'm guessing it's different in various countries. Is it illegal in Brazil to publish someone's address? Because I think in the UK it would be, I have to double check, but you can't just publish pictures of children, for example. What's the law like in Brazil? You can publish because it's not a threat. Public information. It was not a threat. 
and, and, and he was smart when he posted it because it, he lives here. This is the anyone. only thing. So, but the thing is, my point is why I'm saying that are not, they are not prepared, the legal departments and the, and, the, and, the, and the newsrooms in general, because they should be prepared before something happened in advance, a priori, not in posteriori. Right? So, of course it's not a crime, but if we know these people work that way, we should, um, for example, push the Congress to change the law, to protect us um, uh, and journalists and artists and everything, everyone who felt like uh, uh, threatened by this machine of hate. And we will definitely focus on, on that more because I think that's the key point you know we all know that there's an issue now you've lived it on your own skins and it's how we improve it not just Brazil but everywhere if I can just before that though I guess ask you about your personal experiences because you know we spoke yesterday and you know they're horrific they're shocking they must have shaken you they must continue uh, to to shake you so uh, Patricia, if I can just start with you, because you've really borne the brunt of a, of a lot of this intimidation and digital aggression. So talk us through just a little bit of some of your experiences. Sure. Um, well, I, I'm not a political reporter. I was not you know, covering politics. I used to cover refugees and wars. So I was kind of used to, to challenging situations. But when I started covering this information in Brazil, I just realized that women are targets. And, and this is, I mean, when I first started publishing the stories in, back in 2018, the first thing that happened was like in, in five minutes, there was this, like all kinds of fake news. People who were not me, uh, they were saying, oh, so this is her and, and she's been sentenced to X, Y, Z. Then they got all my public information and, you know, she's going to be at this place uh, and started distributing in WhatsApp groups, telling people to go there and confront me. So I couldn't get out of my house. Then they started calling my phone and saying, you're a communist whore, I'm going to beat you up. Then you had things like, because you had this, all these lies circulating, you had like my neighbor, next door neighbor, not next door, next building, every time I would be on the street, she would open the window and scream, you're a communist whore. And I'm thinking, what? This is like a person who lives right here, right? So this was the first step of it. And of course, then, I mean, I had to go to police and we had to get security because they identified my son and my son was six. And so they were sending messages saying, you know, you better leave the country with your six-year-old son because uh, that's not a threat, that's a warning. So, so this is the first part. And then the second part was the sexual stuff, which is something I guess we all live, and, and they're never going to say, you're reporting sex, or this is a bad story. No, they're going to say, you know, you offer sex, or you're old, or you're fat, or you're ugly, or... Something like that, right? Or just threaten your family. Shaming, trying to shame you. Exactly. So, and when the president of the country says that on, on live TV, which is basically what happened, um, Bolsonaro and, and his son, actually his son went on the Congress uh, floor and he said, so this lady, Patricia Campos Mello, she's offering sex in, ex in exchange for damaging information about my father. And then he, he did that and he went on, you know, to do a video about this and, and because there was, um, I mean, I, I did so many stories about this, but one of them was with uh, a former employee from a marketing agency. And at some point he insinuated that I had, uh, you know, been trying to seduce him or something. And when he did that, what did I do? The same minute I published all the conversations we had, all the audio recordings, it was not off the record, pictured everything which showed that none of that had happened, right? But that doesn't matter. The truth doesn't really matter, right? Because two minutes after he says that, President Sun goes online and starts doing video saying this, and goes on the Congress floor saying this, and then the other sons of the president, and then the president himself, gives an interview and makes a joke with a pun with my name and 
anal sex. And that's on TV. Um, so after, after this happens, it's like there's green light for everyone. So what happens is deep fake porn video, um, like all kinds of horrible memes. There's, well, I'll show you, memes with the Pope. Me I mean, all this graphic stuff. And, and this, it does not go away. I mean, I, I don't ever respond because I'm, I don't know, that's my personality, right? I mean, not sure if that's good or not, but um, it, does, uh, it doesn't go away and it, it gets like the messages and, and you all should have got, I mean, I hope you did not, but many of us get those horrible messages. So it got to a point that I felt I had to sue uh, the president that, so that he would stop saying that. Thank you for sharing all of that because obviously it's, you know, it's painful and I have to say that the sort of fake porn, it goes without saying, of course it's obvious, it could happen to, to anyone for, for any reason. I mean, anyone can do this in their bedroom on a computer. I mean, it's, it's so, and of course you can go around saying, of course it's fake, but it's still, it's still hurtful. So, you know, thank you for sharing all of that. Just one final point because on, on this, because we were meant to have this discussion in 2020 and then of course COVID happened. Um, and actually, a lot of time obviously has elapsed and the whole COVID story, which of course you also both got it in the neck for because of what was happening in Brazil and Bolsonaro sort of ignoring COVID and pretending it was just going to go away. What have things, what has changed over the past two years? So has anything got better because there is more attention? So Rana Ayub, for example, the journalist from India that is also here, you know, I remember her telling me a very similar story three years ago. I'm just wondering, uh, we know that Daniela told us that legally speaking, there's no change, but culturally speaking, do you get a sense that people are realizing that this is just another way to intimidate female journalists? Um, I think the women, uh, the solidarity of the women at that time made a difference because you had like all, not just journalists, but women, you know, saying, see, this is not acceptable. Like, you, you, can't, you can't do that, not because you're president or not because you have all these bots and office of hate and stuff. So that in turn puts pressure on internet platforms because that's the only thing that works, public relations. That's, that's the only thing they care about, right? Bottom line. So I guess they are at least trying to, to do something. I'm not sure, it, it's not really uh, useful because people, I mean, and I'm sure Daniela felt that too, when something like that happens, I mean, it's fine. We, we really, we have to have criticism. It's, it's, it's important that, you know, our bosses are the readers, the viewers, so if something is wrong, but when something like that happens and you have like your picture and, 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 you know, fake stuff all over, it's like, have you ever, maybe some people, I think some people dream that you, you, you wake up and you're like in the middle of the crowd and you're naked and everybody's looking at you and you're like, okay, so I'm never going to leave my house again. That's the feeling, basically. And, and cause something similar, I mean, not just in India to run you, but happens to other journalists. And of course, there's always a cultural context and it's horrible for any woman anywhere, but in some parts of the world, the cultural context makes it so that it really is disastrous to your life and reputation in a way that's even worse to what would happen to us in sort of, you know, Western or South American uh, countries. Uh, Daniela, you actually resigned from your job where you were the sort of groundbreaking first female editor. You did that in 2019. I mean, again, tell us your experiences as well and, and what led to that decision to resign? Because of course you have to take care of yourself, but as editor in chief, like you mentioned before, you're reporters as well. Yeah. Um, I, first I would l love to um, jump into the Patricia um, uh, comment in two things uh, about um, the reaction of uh, women. Um, I had many um, conversations with friends of mine, including you. I don't, I don't know if you remember the Nabraji uh, Congress at some point, because we started to banalize some words through, um, uh, said, like whore, uh, prostitute, um, uh, I don't know, you know that, um, being raped, I ah, know. And I heard so many times, 
women journalists saying, oh no, it's, they, they, don't, they only call, us, um, call me a whore. It's okay. It's not a death threat. We can't banalize that. We can't banalize that because things start that way. You know, first they are calling us whore and it's okay. Then they are doing the warnings because this was what Patricia said. I left the country, I resigned first because um, I had not only an issue with Bolsonaro because I published a story um, that they didn't like or they thought was uh, outrageous for, for the family, but also because the media company that, 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 that I used to work for um, at some point was trying to, you know, um, approach Bolsonaro and they forced me to publish an apologize note uh, uh, for the fa Bolsonaro family. And I said, no, I don't publish that because I, I, I did nothing wrong. This story was discussed in this newsroom during three months. Everyone here, executive editors, the directors, everyone know, knew that. And why, I'm not, uh, why should I do that? So I resigned along other 10 people. And um, one thing that, that happened. Um, I felt a lack of solidarity among uh, Pauls, my colleagues, not because I got many messages and direct messages and private emails, but not like in, in publicly. And I understand because in Brazil, it's a country of 220 million people and we have like three major outlets to work. If you are, uh, 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 you, if you write, if you're a, a journalist, you're not a video or a TikTok influencer. Or so. so it's very restrict the, the, you know, the, 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 the field you can, you can act. So um, first I, I felt ab absolutely um, alone. Second, the legal department response to this um, issue was absolutely... Um, it was pointless for me. And, uh, and then the warning. You know, my, my kids, my, my daughter's picture, this um, idea of, okay, I'm, I have the guts to, to, to move forward, to continue in this, uh, on this track. And then uh, I, I felt that I couldn't, even because I was editor-in-chief. It was, a, it was, a, it was a very, um, it's another position. And I think the, the message to the, to the rest of the newsroom was terrible because if, if one story implies in the resignation of the editor-in-chief, imagine if you decided to write something lighter or more or lighter, like uh, uh, worse about you know, the, 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 the president. So uh, the two points uh, uh, about this. And another thing, is um, when Patricia mentioned um, that Bolsonaro and his minister's office, uh, cabinet officers, is spreading this. A Reuters Institute has a good, very good research on um, when misinformation comes from the top. It's so hard to, you know, to combat, to battle. So uh, this is something that we should you know, try to understand better because unfortunately, I don't think we are able to, you know, combat this in a good way. Because you comment, just another question to you, because you combat this uh, sort of by, by contesting the, the misinformation, but just talk us through the panorama of media in Brazil. So how many people would read your publications, which are, you know, highly respected and the most read in Brazil, but looking at the numbers, how many people read newspapers or get their information from magazines, the official TV stations or social media? What's the balance there? It's tiny. It's actually sad. Um, I mean, the circulation of the main newspapers in Brazil, the three main newspapers together, should be like no more than 1.5 half, half million for... So, say that again? 1.5 million uh, the three main newspapers together for a population of 209 million. Whereas you have around 140 million WhatsApp users 
getting their information, and I mean another 60, 60 million uh, Telegram users, getting the information from all this, uh, also the junk news websites, I mean, they emulate news websites. You look at them and like, okay, so this is a le legitimate, but it's actually government people behind it. So it's what the, Danny was saying, it's so hard to compete. Uh, we're trying to get the information out there, uh, but it is tiny, right? And, and, and even the TV, TV you might know uh, better, I mean, it's also losing a lot of uh, audience. Yeah. And, but look, this is interesting to point out, like, hate cabinet attacked influencers, online influencers as well. Yes. So one of the, the, the most famous uh, influencer in Brazil, uh, his name is Felipe Neto. My daughter is there, she knows how many followers he has, how many, I think it's 8 million followers, right? I think, yes. 40. For, more or less like this. And young people get information about, about politics from him. And him in the last, um, in the past, like two years, he became a very um, political um, driven person, right? And uh, talking a lot about um, the left and, about, and against Bolsonaro. And this guy was also targeted by the, 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 the hate cabinet, saying that he was a pedophile. Huh? And other things. Yeah, uh, right, so. right after he did an interview for the New York Times, a video interview, he was being vocal about the authoritarianism rising in Brazil. Right after that, they started, they basically uh, made up uh, fake conversations that were, he seemed to be a pedophile. And when you're saying these things go to the real world, they, he had in front of his house, of his uh, condo, uh, people yelling, you know, you want to have sex with kids, uh, you're against our families, uh, and this is all artificially generated. It's like none of it is true. Particularly terrifying, I guess, for someone who's a social media influencer, because there's apps, I mean, we had the conversation about how the legal department doesn't know what to do, but at least there kind of is a legal department, and but for, I guess, freelance journalists or any online influencers, it would be terrifying. Um, now, Brazil has had, I mean, everyone's had a difficult time over the past few years, but like we mentioned earlier, COVID really hit Brazil. One could argue because the president was in slight denial for a long time. Um, so that happened and there was a lot of international focus. So certainly on the international channels, you would see that effectively the mass graves. And now there's an election coming up in a couple of months. Um, so then how, how is all of that having an impact? Because I'm assuming that the hate cabinet will be going into overdrive now. Both of you. I mean, yeah, I mean, during COVID, it was, uh, we're talking about, it's just, uh, they had a thing called scoreboard of life, the government. So they would only publish numbers of people who had survived COVID. So, for instance, if you are a person who only follows social account, media, uh, government social media accounts and government, uh, pro-government websites, and of course, if you're a government supporter, you think the main TV, TV Global is communist, all the newspapers are communist, so you don't read those. You think Brazil is wonderful, we're like the best country dealing with COVID, and people were dying and dying because the president was delaying to get vaccines and, and do all that, right? So when we all, uh, like I, I was reporting from public hospitals, like we reporters, we were seeing people dying and there was no oxygen. People literally suffocated. And we would be viewed as vultures. You know, everything's so good, people are surviving. That's the word that was actually used yeah. to describe yes. you yes. by, by government, people linked to the yes. government, right? Yes. So why, why are you being such, you know, the vultures? So pessimistic. So pessimistic, right? I mean, see how many people are surviving. They, they even try to um, distort statistics from the Ministry of Health and then the media outlets. We started getting our information, numbers direct from the government, state governments, because otherwise the numbers would be fake. So now maybe Daniela wants to talk about the, the elections. Uh, yeah, but um, to, to add uh, <laughs> a, a new characteristic about this, there was this um, group team of journalists, 
getting information from uh, local governments. But when elections are coming up, even the states are hiding information because the governors don't want to, you know, to, to show that their states, their, 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 their governments are doing badly. So, we are in the dark. Um, do you about. think even now, I mean, even do now. you feel confident that you know the statistics from Brazil? No, no, I, I think we don't know any inf any statistic, uh, uh, reliable statistic coming, uh, com that comes from the government. We, we don't have any. And that's why I think, um, for example, elections. Next elections will be in October. Uh, Bolsonaro is a candidate. And um, Lula, the former president who was in, 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 who was in power for uh, eight years, and then she, he made uh, her, his successor, Dilma, who was impeached, but she was in, in, the, uh, in power for six years. Anyways, Lula is leading the polls. And Bolsonaro, um, they have um, uh, a gap of, I think, 14, yeah, 16, it decreased, like 12, 14. Yeah, and it's getting um, less, uh, uh, the, this distance between them. Why? I think um, because, first, people are reading the polls, in a, we should be reading the polls in a different way, and we talked about this last, uh, last night. Um, people always, always pay attention in numbers, in party arrangements, this party B with party A, and left and right, when we should, be, we should pay attention in um, data and um, feelings that come from these statistics, this polls. For example, in December, Datafolha, which is the largest uh, poll institute in Brazil, published two... Um, um, researches. First, 44% of Brazilians think Brazil will become communist if Lula uh, wins. Communist. We never had that. If you stop someone in the middle of the road and, and said, please define communist. Communism. I, I doubt I give a, a kidney yeah. <laughs> if, if you get, you know, a, 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 a Right. We never or had communism in the current no. Second uh, research, 51% of the interviews uh, uh, don't want to see in adver uh, um, LGBT couples in advertising on TV. It says a lot about the country. Because all this agenda of human rights, the defense of minorities, LGBT rights, women, it's it's a, a, unfortunately, it's a leftist agenda because it's, it's universal. It should be a, 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 a broader agenda for, you know, all parties. But in, unfortunately, in Brazil, it's not. And in general, in, around the world, across the world. So I pay attention a lot in this data because it, it, it says about what people feel when they got home when they are at home, alone, lock it up in the bathroom, you know? Because people, for example, um, polls in Brazil are, uh, are made by phone, usually, um, more or less. Datafolha and Ibope, no. Datafolha, it's, it's, it's not. Yeah, but the, the other institutes are, do a lot of um, research by phone. Which sometimes is not, it's, it's, it's better because for example, it's, it's, it's a, not a shame saying um, I'm voting for Bolsonaro, but it's not, it sounds good depending on, uh, on, um, on your, you know, environment. So by, on the phone you can say, okay, I will vote for him. In person you can get probably a more reliable uh, answer, but also a shamed one who will you know, mix up uh, the results. So, polls are hard to understand and hard to focus. Which is worrying, but, but 
you sort of also hint or suggest, you know, the enormous disinformation that is going around. You know, we mentioned because most people don't read, the, you know, reliable newspapers. It goes on social media. And there's one story that you told me that I have to say, I mean, you know, not much, not much in this should make any of us laugh, but this did bring a smile. And it was, I'm just going to say the words and then I'm going to ask you guys to take it away because I can't do the story justice. But it involves the phrase, and I don't know where the translator is, but hang in there. It involves the phrase, uh, penis-shaped baby bottles. So, um, I don't in know. good you, you Portuguese, you... mamadeira de piroca. Yeah, and I'd so love to know how, how it's getting translated in Italian. I was going to go biberona forma di pene, but, you know, it's, it's up to the, debate. So you know, In a, in a really most vulgar sad. way. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's what's really sad. It sounds like a yeah, joke. So explain. It sounds well. I mean, because it's so absurd. It's so absurd. But but tell us. Yeah, tell us what it is. I mean, in, in 2018, we had this humongous wave of disinformation, mainly on WhatsApp. And one of the things that was the most popular uh, piece of disinformation that was going around was a penis-shaped baby bottle saying that the left-wing candidate was going to try to indoctrinate uh, kids at elementary schools uh, to sexualize them and to make them maybe, uh, you know, choose uh, their... Se talk about sexuality too soon. And part of that would be the penis-shaped baby bottle. There were pictures, like they, they actually created a, a... And just to paint the picture, it's the teat of the bottle shaped like a... Yes. Yeah, so. And you know what? We have the, the feeling and the impression sometimes that, oh, it's not for... Uh, who, who would believe in that? My father sent me this picture on my WhatsApp saying, you know what? These people, they are crazy. Look what they are. My father... I'm a journalist, and my, uh, we, we went to, you know, we are in a, you know, I don't know, educated environments, but, but no, it's not something that is far from us. And, um, and this is, was the first steps of the hate cabinet, because Bolsonaro's sons, uh, uh, one of them, him, them, is behind these first, you know, ideas of trying to uh, bring uh, and spread this information. Um, and it's very, uh, it's so similar to uh, QA, you know, because they focus on uh, this conspiracy, hidden conspiracy about pedophilia and communism. And There's also one that was very interesting during COVID because Bolsonaro did not want people to think that COVID was serious. So he was saying, oh, you know, it's just a, it's just a code. So there was a video and that went viral and many people believed it, uh, that they were burying coffins with stones inside, that people were not really dying. But can I just ask a sort of devil's advocate question? I mean, with COVID everywhere, I mean, ultimately people saw others die around them. I mean, in Brazil, there must, you know, I saw the pictures and I didn't, I didn't report from there, but on reliable international media. I mean, there comes a point where if your neighbors are dying, you know there's not stones in that coffin. Did that, I mean, did Brazil's astronomical death rates have an impact in trying to, you know, show that what the Bolsonaro narrative wasn't obviously 100% or even 50%? Well, at some, yeah, at some point, after a few months, uh, he lost a lot of uh, popularity because of that and because he delayed the vaccine and he was not believing. So in the end, I think people started to realize, right? But and, I, and I will do a criticism... Um, uh, about the media co in Brazil covering, because I was living in the UK back then during the, the, the pandemic. And the difference on how, and look, UK didn't manage, you know, the thing <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> so well. Believe but um, um, journalistic speaking, the way you see um, the pictures of, uh, of uh, sick people dying in the hospitals and like drowning the dry, this is the, the, the image, they are like drowning in the dry, uh, um, impact you so much. And in Brazil, I don't know why, there is a kind of, you know, oh no, we can't show this Squeamishness. Kind. Yeah, of. so we never, uh, they, they, they show the coffins, uh, we see um, the, the, the oxygen bottles arriving at the hospital, but, but we don't see 
people dying, which is not a good thing to see, but in times of crisis, it's something that shakes you, you know? You said, oh my God, even if you had a daughter, a, daughter, a, a neighbor, or your father who had died from, from, from COVID, it's like covering uh, climate change, for example. Look at this, it's interesting because every time you see a story about climate change, is a bear trying to get it still into a, a, a small piece of an iceberg, and there's no face, there's no people, or there's like burning trees, or so, so it's, it's kind of, um, for me at least, hard to relate with the story, even if you know how important it is, we need to put faces and life stories to get a, 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 an, eff, an effective response from the readers and from people. I guess it's like the refugee crisis here in Europe when you had the picture of the little boy in the Alan red shirt, Kurdi. Alan Kurdi, that's people actually realize, well, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, the, the level of empathy. I mean, I do, I do think some of that is human nature. You know, we need to relate to, to, to you know, people that we could empathize and it's always that it could be me, it could be my son, it could be... We're coming to nearly the end of the session. Um, I'd like to finish with what we can do to improve it. But, but just one final more kind of technical Bolsonaro government. How aware do you think people are of this hate cabinet? I mean, I'm guessing the vast majority of the population probably not from the level of disinformation you've spoken about, but at other levels, maybe not journalists, but sort of normal people who are interested, let's put it that way. Well, there's investigations. The Supreme Court has uh, two investigations. The Electoral Court has one investigation uh, ongoing. And also, uh, last year, there were Supreme Court rulings that were mentioning, I mean, not by name, but saying, you know, if you do this during the elections, uh, we're going to annul your candidacy or something. So in a level, something that people used to say in 2018, that doesn't exist. You know, that's only, uh, they, call, they used to say, Chia do Zappi, uh, our aunt from WhatsApp. You know, it's just your aunt on WhatsApp. You know, there's no uh, bots, there's no. So people realize, uh, I think there's an awareness, but restricted, right? I mean, it's always very. But you know what? The problem is nobody cares, actually. You know, it's something that people are so overwhelmed. And, and it can, you can imagine the situation in Brazil, because we are living abroad, you know? And even we, um, being away from, you know, the daily basis turmoil, we feel so, uh, you know, exhausted and, and um, touched by everything. So imagine you getting news every day morning, after, and evening, about some outrageous thing Bolsonaro has done or someone linked to him, and plus COVID, and plus Ukraine, and plus uh, economy, and yeah. plus. So it's, I, literally, all my friends are drinking more or taking like uh, restricted medicines to their mental health. No, it's true. It's a problem. It's a health problem. And we had panels here in this festival about the, the mental health problem among journalists because it's, uh, it's something, it's serious. Absolutely. And, and working alone for many during the pandemic didn't help. Uh, a very final one on, on Bolsonaro because, of course, there's the election coming up. Should he win again, he's got another term with which to influence the judiciary. What impact would that have? Well, <laughs> we are all in a complicated situation. I guess many people are gonna have to leave the country, like journalists like us. Many journalists are being judicially harassed. Uh, there's businessmen, I think it's, it's similar to Turkey in a way that you have uh, businessmen who are close to the president who go on and like there's one specific businessman, he's suing 38 uh, journalists, um, one of them. Uh, Daniela's one of your former reporters was one of them for like two million. It's like a lot of money. And for now, the Supreme Court, he appointed two justices, right? So Supreme Court is still um, sort of balanced. If he wins re-election, he's gonna appoint another two justices. So he's gonna give, have the majority of Supreme Court. And, and what scares us is like, it's, it's what's happening 
and what's happening in India, in Turkey, what's probably going to happen in the Philippines, Hungary, when they get reelected, they uh, end, uh, you know, they end the dismantling of the checks and balances. And of course, the United States, where and a huge proportion States. of the, exactly. you know, of the Republican Party does not believe the election result. And I mean, if that happens in the U.S., that which you know we historically see as the mother of democracies, then yeah, obviously and, it's a and, and that leads it's it's I mean that's an excellent point. Even if Bolsonaro does not win in Brazil, we may end up with over you know a huge proportion of the population who thinks that he did win, because he's also doing the same thing as Trump did, you know, saying, oh, the election's gonna be rigged, fraudulent, blah, blah. So, it's like a no win. Yeah, he's, he, it's, it's already in, in, um, in March, in March uh, a campaign of, uh, for undermining the, the electronic ballot. There's a hashtag called a, pr um, a print vote now, because in Brazil we are um, in many years ahead with this uh, electronic ballot thing, and we and works perfectly. We never had any problem. It was audited by many international um, uh, companies, and there's there's very uh, reliable uh, way to vote. Even because we have like the, it's a huge country, and um, and everything vote in Brazil is mandatory, which is a difference as well. So um, the idea of, um, and, and, and another Bolsonaro son who is a congressman as well, he, he was in, in the US during um, the, the January the, 6th. Yeah, the capital invasion, the January the 6th. And he said back then, oh, they did it wrong. So, like if it were in Brazil, we would do the right thing, which yeah. is actually consummate a coup d'etat. So there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, evidences in front of our, uh, you know, faces. And this is the most um, critical point of everything. We feel like what to do, how to react. I mean, and of course, I mean, just to take it back to the original point about the hate cabinet and how it works, you know, a free and strong independent press that isn't intimidated is key to democracies from Brazil to the US to everywhere. So as a final kind of thought, let's look to the future and see how maybe some things within our gift, our power could be improved. And we spoke for a long time about how, um, you mentioned, uh, Daniela, that companies don't know what to do, that you call your legal office and it's like, you know, and, and I know this also in a very, very different way, you know, much safer uh, way in the UK of, you know, other colleagues that have been intimidated and harassed. And you call the press office, I'm not gonna name names, but of, you know, the biggest networks in the world. And it's like, their answer is, yeah, just don't reply. And I'm not sure, and I know that, you know, you also like don't know. I mean, yeah, sure, but in every case, I mean, if someone starts publishing your address, well, you just don't reply. So, focusing on what could we do, or crucially, at least for those of us who have the protection of working for a big company, what could a big company do? If you had the head of, you know, either the main broadcasters or whatever, what would you have wanted to see in place when you made that call? I think news companies should hire people who are experts in digital first to respond immediately and with, um, with, with impact and be prepared before something happens. We should, be, they had, it's like um, an army. You have to have your army uh, ready for the combat because a, a war happens, we, we know, there's no uh, uh, <laughs> a date, a calendar, okay, this war will start on January the 1st, probably, but no, in general. So I think my point is companies are doing their job in a way they could be doing better. Yeah, they should have, I agree with uh, Daniela, they should have uh, digital security experts helping all of us, you know, how should I deal with this? What do I do with this person who's, you know, when should I, uh, like, report to the police? Because sometimes that's the point, right? And also, uh, there, there has to be an institutional response, a backing 
from the media outlet. You know, maybe you're not personally going to respond, and I think this is really counterproductive because you're just going to amplify the stuff. But you need to have the backing of your company. You need to have your company saying, "See, this is not normal. This is not acceptable." Because also, a lot of the companies will have accounts with millions and millions of followers. So, I mean, yes, there's an organized army on one hand, but you know, we're not without digital weapons, if you will, when you mobilize the journal. I mean, I just find there's so much. I just think that there should be someone that goes through your mentions. I don't know why I always think Twitter is the, I don't know, at, at least I, I think that's kind of like a bit of a battleground. I just think that someone in the press office should go through your mentions. There is no way that you should go through your own mentions because it's just hurtful, but someone should monitor it to see if you are getting doxxed, if things have been published, if there's a picture of your house or, you know, your children or, or whatever. You know, there's so much I don't know. Like, what's the difference between retweeting or some people do a screen grab? And then, you know, there's a lot of things to do with the algorithm. And, and yeah, I mean, like you, I just don't think anybody knows in press office. Yeah, and, and, then, and I think my final point w would be we don't have uh, artificial intelligence doing journalism yet. Journalism is made by people, and um, companies need to invest to protect their people. Not instead of spending so much money in trying to, you know, being, so I don't know, design thinking on whatever thing, invest on your people because we do the job. But you guys both work sort of, at, or you've had fellowships at some of the main universities, both in the US and the UK. Do you hear that conversation? Is it happening at any level, at any, in any country? Yes, I, I, I have there's, that. There's a, a growing awareness that, you know, this is a really a, a high burden on journalists, that it makes us think twice, and I'm sure everybody else, like, okay, so am I going to publish this story? What's going to happen to me? So at least there's an awareness. Before, people were just like, oh, okay, that's, you know, internet people. Just, they're going to, it's going to go away. Just, you know, you go to sleep, tomorrow it's going to go away. So there's more of an awareness, at least, um, I'm not sure how that translates into action. Rightly or wrongly, and you may not want to be, but you're both examples for a lot of journalists of, you know, of courage for facing what you faced and continuing to do your work. You may not want to be, but you are. And, you know, I mean, I certainly have huge admiration for you both. What advice would you give to a young journalist, uh, especially, I guess, a young female journalist in Brazil who wants to do you know, who wants to work as a serious journalist touching the serious stories, what would your honest advice be? Don't be biased, don't be an activist, be um, impartial, um, and uh, speak out. Um, if something happens to you, don't banalize bad words about you. Um, I think this is still the best job in the world. So I would tell you, you know, don't get intimidated. Just keep on doing your job the best we can, trying to be fair. Don't get intimidated because it's still the best job in the world. It is. Thank you. Patricia Campos Mayo, Daniel Pinheiro, thank you so much, ladies. It's been a great chat. It's been great getting to know you as well. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you soon.